to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim the news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18. Welcome to our study of what are the differences. Maybe somebody's asked you before, what's the difference between the church of Christ and other religious groups? What makes the church unique? Why would I want to become a part of the Church of Christ? As we think today in our lesson about in our Soul Saving series, a person needs to understand that Jesus only built one church. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 4, there is but one body. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, the body is the church. And of course Jesus said, I'll build my church, not churches. Jesus never intended for the multitude of religious groups that exist today to be His church. His church is singular. His church is unique. But someone asked, what is it that makes the church stand out from other religious groups? There are four things we're going to mention in this lesson today that help us to understand why the Church of Christ is different or unique. First of all, our structure of authority is different. By structure we mean the way authority flows down to those in the church today. For example, in some religious groups you have a, a hierarchy. For example, in Catholicism you have the Pope, you have archbishops, you have a local diocese, you have an area-wide diocese, and, and it comes down some chain of men. Is that God's structure of authority today? Absolutely not. The scripture says, call no man father. Matthew chapter 23 and verse 9. Well, how is the New Testament structure of authority different than what we see in religious groups? First of all, there are no earthly headquarters on this earth today in the United States or anywhere else for the Lord's church. Some people say Rome's the headquarters. Others say Salt Lake City or Jerusalem. In the church you read about in the New Testament, the headquarters is in heaven. Hebrews 1 verse 4, Jesus is reigning at the right hand of the throne of God. He is the head of the church. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23 and Jesus clearly said in Matthew 16 verse 19 whatever you bind on earth will already be bound in heaven whatever you loose on earth will already be loosed in heaven. And so we don't have some earthly headquarters where people go to and say is this the head of this religious group? No. Our headquarters are in heaven. The office, the headquarter of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is in heaven emanating from the throne of God where all decisions have already been made. I want you to notice the words of Psalm 119 verse 89. We don't look to a head today or some synod. Notice what the scripture says. The Bible says forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. On religious matters, heaven has already decided. Heaven is the headquarters because that's where God Himself is at and He's already decided on all religious matters. It's already settled. We don't need to vote. We don't need to get a group of clerics or whatever you want to call them together and say, now what are we going to believe about this? God's already decided. He's given it to us in His Word and we can know what God wants us to know. Isn't it great to know that this book has everything we need and we can get all the teaching of God to get to heaven out of this. 2 Peter 1 verse 3 says, God has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and by virtue. And so heaven's the headquarters. Matters have already been decided and thus there's no need for a convention. There's no need to vote on beliefs or policies. 
in the Lord's church today, we're not going to say, here's the convention, and at this convention, we're going to vote on homosexuality, or we're going to vote on whether women should preach. No, no need for that. God's already decided in His Word. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17, all Scripture is inspired of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Right here in the Scripture is where we get doctrine. Right here is where we get instruction in righteousness, and thus we don't need to vote or have some synod. Hebrews 6 verse 18 says it's impossible for God to lie. Hebrews 4 verse 12, the Word of God is still living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. So if it's been settled, if heaven's our headquarters, then friends, we need to go to the Bible as our sole source and structure of authority and let God decide. Now in the Lord's church, each congregation is autonomous and self-governed. That is, they each have elders who are the spiritual leaders. Christ is the head of the church. In matters of doctrine, He and God have already decided, but in matters of putting those things into practice, making sure people follow the Word, and spreading the gospel, each congregation is autonomous. Acts chapter 14, verse 23, they appointed elders in every city. Acts chapter 20, every congregation. Acts chapter 20, verse 28, Paul spoke to the elders at the congregation in Ephesus and he told them, you need to take heed, you need to teach, you need to lead, you need to be shepherds of the flock of God which he has made you overseers of. And so their responsibility as a plurality of elders in every congregation was to be leaders, was to be the overseers, is to watch out for people's souls. There's no, there's no pope. There's not going to be one man leading the congregation. That tried to happen one time in the Bible. In 2 John 9, or excuse me, in 3 John 9, Diotrephes tried to be the pope. And you know what John said? He's trying to have the preeminence, and that only belongs to Christ. And thus, elders in every congregation govern and help people put the principles of Christ into their life. But most importantly, we need to understand that Jesus Christ is still the head of the church today. Jesus said, I'll build my church. It belongs to Jesus and He's the builder. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 11 says, No other foundation can any man lay except that which is laid. He's the, the foundation. Ephesians 2 verse 1, it's built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ Himself. And so He's the builder. He's the foundation. It belongs to Him. Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, Jesus purchased the church with His own precious blood. He died for the church. He paid the price. Ephesians 5 verse 25, He is the head of the body. Colossians 1.18, He's the head of the body that in all things Jesus may have the preeminence. And so as head of the church, He tells us what to do and we follow His lead. He has all authority. Matthew 28 verse 18, Jesus said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. There are no men today who have authority to establish doctrine, who have the right to name a church after themselves. They haven't died for it. They're not the head of it. They're not the founder. Jesus is. And thus, our structure of authority is different. We look to God reigning from heaven in His Word, which is already settled, and we follow the principles of Jesus, the head of the church. But not only is the structure of authority different, the source of authority in the Lord's church is different. For example, in the church of Christ, there are no creed books or manuals that are going to state what the church is to believe or practice. There's not going to be a, a, a book of discipline. There's not going to be a catechism. There's not going to be a creed book that says if you're a member of the church of Christ, this is what you're supposed to believe. The Bible is what we follow. 1 John 5 verse 16, we're taught that to do such, to put the teachings of God into human books, that's not right. 
where 1 John chapter 5, verses 13 through 16 says, If we err in that, we transgress God's will. 1 Peter 4, verse 11, we're to speak as the oracles of God. What God has said in His Word, that's what we say. Psalm 119, 160, the Scripture says the entirety of God's Word is truth. And so we don't have a creed book that we're going to open up and say, Now faith, let's turn to page 323 and see what we're to believe. No, we say, what do the Scriptures teach? What does God want us to believe in His Word? The church looks to the Bible. God's Word for its beliefs and all its practices. There are two great questions that I want you to remember. Jeremiah 37 verse 17, uh, an evil king asked a wonderful question. Is there any word from the Lord? In the Lord's church, that's what we ask today. We don't ask what did religious leaders 500 years ago teach. We don't ask what did church fathers teach. We don't ask what did so-and-so who's got a doctorate teach. We ask, is there any word from the Lord? The second question, Romans chapter 4, verse 3. What does the Scripture say? Not the creed book, not the pastor, which is not a biblical term to begin with, what, not a biblical term for a preacher. What does the Scripture say? Matthew 7, 21, Jesus taught us. It's not just everybody who says, Lord, Lord, that's going to heaven, but he who does what? The will of of the Father. That's the person who's going to heaven. And here's what's interesting. You cannot know and do the will of God without the Bible. Did you know that? You cannot know what God's will is and you can't do it without following the teaching of the Bible. Psalm 119 verse 11 tells us that we know God's will. How can a young man keep himself clean? By taking heed according to your word. With, your, with my whole heart I have sought you. God's word must be hidden in our heart that we might not sin against him. I can know the Bible is my source. John 8, 32, Jesus said, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And oh, how I love the words of Mary. In John chapter 2, verse 5, what great advice she gave to the servants then and to us today. The context is this. Jesus is about to perform His first miracle. The pots have run out of, of grape juice, of wine, the text says, and Mary requests of Jesus that He refill those. Of course, at, at first He's hesitant, but He agrees to do that. And in John 2, verse 5, Mary turns to the servants and says this, Whatever He tells you to do, do it. Can you find any greater advice concerning the source of our authority than that? Whatever Jesus tells you to do, do it. You see, we strive to only do that which God authorizes. Notice the words of Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17. What do we mean by saying that the Bible is our only source of authority? Notice Colossians 3, 17. The scripture says, and whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. The sole source of authority for what we say, what we do, must be the Word of God. It's that Word that is going to judge us on the last day. Jesus said in John 12, 48, He who rejects me does not receive my word, has that which judges him. The Word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. We try not to go beyond that which is written. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 6 and the reason is this. The gospel is God's power of salvation. Romans 1 16. The word of God is able to make one wise unto salvation. James 1 21. We're told to study the word, to preach the word, and to live the word in our life, but we're never told to put man's opinions and ideas above the Word of God. And so our source of authority is different. We believe the Bible only makes Christians only and the only Christians. You cannot be a child of God outside of taking the Bible, doing only what it says, and following God's will. That's the only way a person can become a Christian, by following the New Testament. Now what else is different? about the Lord's church, the name or description of the church is different. And what, here's what we mean by name. We're not talking about official titles. We're not talking about titles like some have on religious groups today. 
all that a name is is a description of one's character. It's a description maybe of who you are, a description of who you belong to. The terms Church of Christ and Church of God, they're not official titles. They are descriptions of ownership and they're biblical descriptions or names. See, these terms teach us who the church belongs to and who its allegiance is to. The name Church of Christ is a biblical name. In Romans chapter 16, verse 16, Paul said, Greet one another with a holy kiss, the churches of Christ. Who? The churches of Christ greet you. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2, To the church of God, which is at Corinth. There are biblical names or descriptions that you read of in Scripture and these always give honor and allegiance to Jesus and to God. It's the church itself that belongs to Jesus Christ. I want you to notice again the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. This is what makes the church unique. We want to honor God even in the way we describe ourselves. Matthew 16, look in verse 18. Jesus said, and I also say to you that you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Now question, whose church did Jesus say he would build? Did he say he would build John Wesley's church or John Calvin's church or John Knox's church or, or anybody else's church? Jesus said, I will build my church. If Jesus built His church, then let's describe ourselves in the way the Bible does. The church of God, the church of Christ, uh, the church that the Lord purchased. Remember Acts 20 verse 28? Jesus purchased the church with His own precious blood. Who paid the price? Did some man 1,500 years pay the price for the church? No, when Jesus hung and died on the cross, it was His blood that purchased the church. If He paid the price and He purchased the church, the church belongs to Jesus Christ. And thus, the church should not belong to any human, to their name, to their method, to their government, or their organization today. Did you know that denominationalism is against the will of God? In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 through 13, Paul speaks about the problem of division and denominationalism in the first century. Paul said there, I hear that there are divisions among you. Each of you says, I'm of Paul, or I'm of Paulus, or I'm of Cephas. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or are you baptized in the name of Paul? What's his point? Let there be no divisions among you. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10, If it wasn't right for them to say, I'm of Paul, or I'm of Cephas, or I'm of Apollos, how can it be right today to call ourselves by the names of other men, to call what we believe the church is after other people's name? You see, the description we give must be a biblical description. The church of God, the church of the Lord, the church of Christ, the temple of God, 1 Timothy 3.15, the church of the firstborn, Hebrews 12, verse 28. All these are, are biblical descriptions or names that show us who the church itself belongs to. And so the church is different in its description or its name. Finally, the church is also different in that its plea for unity is different. So many in our world, so many in our world today say, just choose the church of your choice and everything's going to be okay. They say there are many roads that lead to heaven. We're all on different paths going to the same place. That's not God's plea in the New Testament. And that is definitely not the plea of the New Testament church. The Bible clearly teaches there's one church. Now this is going to be foreign to what a lot of people believe. But I want you to ask yourself as we think about these passages, does the scripture teach there's just one church? Well, listen again to what Jesus said. Matthew 16, verse 18, Upon this rock I will build my church. From that verse, how many churches did Jesus say He'd build? One rock, Jesus Christ, one church. Now, is that the case throughout the New Testament? Sure it is. In Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, the Bible says Jesus is the head of the body, which is the church. Now, just for a moment, I want you to, for a moment, I want you to realize the body is the church. Those are synonyms. Jesus is the head of the body, which is the church. How many bodies are there? 
Well, if you look over to Ephesians 4, verse 4, among those seven ones, there is one body. If the body is the church and there's one body, how many churches are there? Just one. That's why Paul said, let there be no divisions among you. This is something taught throughout the Scripture. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, by one spirit we're all baptized into one body. How many? One body, one church. God has always wanted His people to be united. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Psalm 133 and verse 1. And I want you to see the plea of Jesus in the New Testament concerning unity. Notice John 17, verse 20 and 21. Jesus said, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. How many did Jesus say there? Three, four, five, three thousand? No. Jesus said that they all may be one. Does it look like people who claim to be Christians are one today? Absolutely not. Jesus never intended for it to be the way that it is. The Bible teaches that the road to heaven is exclusive. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. If I get to heaven only by Christ and Jesus only built one church, there's only one road to heaven. That's exactly what Jesus said in Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Jesus is here talking about religious people. And in Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14, He said, Wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go down it, because narrow is the way, and difficult is the, uh, narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way that leads to eternal life, and few there are who find it. Did Jesus say everybody's going to heaven? No, Jesus said the way is difficult and narrow, restricted, exclusive. And only those who get on that road are going to be right with God. Oh, how we need to make sure that we don't listen to men, but rather we come to the Bible as our only source for learning about the church of the New Testament. Exodus chapter 23 and verse 2, there is a grave warning. Do not follow a multitude to do evil. We must never do what we do because the multitude thinks it's right. Ephesians chapter 4, or excuse me, Ephesians 3 verse 4, we must read and understand what God's will is and then we must endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, the gospel. Men and women today are brought back together with God. We're reconciled in one body and one church. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 16. And so we ask you today, are you a part of the church that you read about in the New Testament? Are you a part of the church that has the right structure? The headquarters is in heaven. Laws have already, teachings have already been decided by God. Those principles are in the Bible and we let Jesus be the only head. Do we have the right source? Do you have the right source of authority? Do you place the Bible as the only source from God? Do we put it as the only guide how to worship, how to be saved, how to live the Christian life? Are we making sure that we wear the right description or the right name? Friend, if you're a part of a religious group, listen carefully. If you're part of a religious group whose name you cannot find in the Bible, how can you be doing that by God's authority? If I can not open my Bible and find the name of the religious group I'm a part of, well, can I be sure I'm doing it by God's authority? Absolutely not. If it's not in here, you can be guaranteed. It's not of God and it's not according to His will. And finally, does it have the right plea for unity? Do we strive? to have the oneness that Jesus prayed for, that He pleaded for, that He died for when He was on this earth? Are we striving to be one upon the teaching of Jesus Christ? If you're not a member of the New Testament church, you can become one today by obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ and doing what God wants you to do. Have you heard the Word of God? Romans 10 verse 17 says, Faith comes by hearing 
and hearing by the Word of God. Have you believed that Jesus is God's Son? Jesus Himself said, unless you believe that I am He, you will surely die in your sins. John chapter 8, verse 24. Have you been willing to repent of past sin in your life and turn to God? The Scriptures teach we must repent and turn again that our sins may be blotted out, that seasons of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Acts 3 verse 19. Have you made the good confession like the man in Acts chapter 8, the Ethiopian eunuch? I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Romans 10 and verse 10 teaches we must make the good confession with the mouth to be saved. And then, have you been baptized, immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins? Remember, we're baptized into the one body. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. The Scripture teaches that baptism does now also, not alone, combined with hearing, believing, repenting, and confessing, baptism does now also save us. If the Bible says baptism saves us, why would I want to be a part of any group that teaches baptism is not essential? Jesus taught it was essential. Jesus said he that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. Mark chapter 16 verse 16. Jesus taught that baptism was something you had to do to be a part of the kingdom here on earth and to ultimately be a part of God's kingdom in heaven. Jesus said in John 3 verse 5, unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. And so we ask you today, are you sure you're a part of the group you read about in this book? Are you sure that you're right with God? If not, we're begging you, we're pleading with you in view of how wonderful heaven will be and how horrible hell will be. Won't you make sure today, make sure that you're right with God so that you can go to heaven before it's too late. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.